One thing I learned is surprising in my career is that the human instinct is often wrong. If I change this color from blue to red, the people will like that. That's your opinion. You are just one person. Even you have 20 years of experience in this field, you could be wrong. I can show you tons of examples that the data will show you totally different than what you thought it to be right. Welcome to The Data Chief. The Data Chief is a podcast for data and analytics leaders to share their personal stories and insights on technology, culture, and leadership. As the world continues to fill with impersonal, factory-machined goods, so increases the desire to see and feel more human creativity in the items we use in our lives. Etsy, a community marketplace for creative goods, was designed to help people sell their unique and homemade items online. The company continues to innovate and transform the small business world, leading by focusing on innovation in their technology. Today's guest, Chu Sheng Shi, is the first chief data officer at Etsy. On this episode, he joins Cindy to discuss his unique perspective on helping build a data-driven organization from the ground up, and how he's fostered a culture of experimentation that has led to rapid growth and transformation within the company. He also dives into trends such as machine learning and data observability and explain some of the most helpful mental frameworks he's learned in his life and career. The Data Chief is presented by our friends at ThoughtSpot, the modern analytics cloud company. ThoughtSpot makes it easy for anyone to analyze your company's data with search and AI. Business people from companies like Walmart, Hulu, Schneider Electric, Cloud Academy, and Mercado use ThoughtSpot to quickly uncover new insights and turn them into action. You can learn more at ThoughtSpot.com. To Chen, welcome to The Data Chief. Thank you for having me here. Looking forward for the conversation today. I am too. Etsy is one of the most beloved brands in our household, and I understand it is for you and your family as well, both from a work viewpoint, but also products. Oh, thank you for saying that. I love Etsy. That's why I joined here. (laughs) (laughs) So maybe I should. So first off, I guess you're joining us from the Bay Area, but maybe to confirm that in this work from anywhere world. Yes, I'm still living in Bay Area, and our headquarters is in New York. So, but uh, in this world, it probably doesn't matter. <laughs> exactly. And so, tell me, what are some of your favorite things you've discovered on Etsy or bought through Etsy? Well, I would say Etsy is a very unique place because. As you can see, um, like uh, they they help us, they help the people to sell their homemade and unique items online. And when I first arrived at the, uh, what I saw is they even have their own, I, I would say, workshop inside their building. So every employee can also go there and learn how to uh, build uh, things they want to sell on Etsy. And you can also learn a lot of skill, like knitting and uh, you know painting. And I think this is super cool. That is super cool. I was going to have prepared for you to show you. I don't know why we buy our return address labels from Etsy, except that they have a cute black bear on them. (laughs) And and in New Jersey, we have black bears, but then everyone in the world would know my home address. So I couldn't show that to you. (laughs) Yes, this sounds very interesting. Yes. Yes, yes. Good. So, Shushan, you've been in this space for a very long time. And I think what's fascinating is you made an early career choice to um, be a practitioner rather than a professor. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, I think that's actually a, a like a, for anyone who gets a PhD, usually their dream job is to become a professor or a scientist. I think that's uh, usually the reason people get a PhD because it's required four or five years of investment of your life. And I'm very fortunate and I, I'm very glad I go through the program and meet a lot of wonderful researcher and professor and I work with them. I, I still enjoy my time uh, when I was in UCLA. And, um, but I think very soon, you know, when you start to learn more about the space, just like a, when you're sitting outside of the fence, you, you, you don't know really what the inside. And I think when I start my PhD, I know I enjoy uh, kind of research, but the things that actually uh, make me feel excited is to really building product that, uh, you know, affect people's life using a cutting edge stage, you know, the state of the art technology. So at the end of the moment, I kind of think knowing that uh, uh, 
I ask myself a very simple question. Like I say, I can only have one life. So I can either become a professor or I can do something different. So I kept using something called regret minimization framework. I think Jeff Bezos mentioned this in one of the talk. Basically, I close my eye, imagine there are 30 years from today, and I'm talking this my life story with my grandson or my like a, or my or talk to my wife. And I think which kind of story will make me more feel excited and happy. And I, I very soon realized I won't have too much regret to become a professor because I already taught before I got to the PhD at the university. I kind of know what the life looked like. But I'm really, really curious what it will be the life in Silicon Valley and become you know industrial. So that's the reason I kind of choose a different path back then. Yeah. So not living with regret, I think that's um, a good way of living. I don't know that I could think about a 30 year year span, I think in smaller slices. And you definitely have had multiple slices, but all in Silicon Valley with some of the hottest companies, whether it's Google, Amazon, Intuit, and now Etsy. Um, T tell us what that's been like and how have you come to focus specifically on the data and analytics side of things? Yes, I think I started doing uh, this kind of machine learning or data job actually long, long time ago before it became a thing. I mean, we keep changing them, but I remember when I first learned this, we called the data mining like 20 years ago, right? And then we called it big data. And of course, data machine learning, AI, deep learning. Or, yeah, yeah, or statistics. Yeah, statistics. <laughs> At one yeah. point it was statistics. <laughs> exactly, so the name keeps changing. But fundamentally, um, I I think of what uh, I, I learned in my career is, what I'm really interesting is I can even write the code as a software engineer. And to me, data is just a, I call the software, software engineering 2.0. It's that you write the software to process data and this data will generate another software which will behave in a certain way that they derive from the data. So I think that's basically what I see the, 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 the new world of writing program. And I always enjoy like dealing with computers or also human beings. And I think to me, um, working in different company, it, one of the reasons is um, like about 10 years in my career, I switched to a management role and I, I start to uh, kind of explore different like uh, uh, size of the company and also different kind of product company. But uh, I always stay in the e-commerce space. So to some extent, my field doesn't change too much. Always on search recommendation, information retrieval. I still active on a conference like a, a Triple W, CIR rec recommendation systems. So I think my field doesn't change too much. And of course, company, um, you know, this big company have different divisions. So naturally, like uh, um, when I have an opportunity in Silicon Valley, I also have a lot of friends and, and connections. So, uh, so to some extent, I'm very fortunate to have opportunity to serve in uh, many uh, outstanding company. Actually, not like a long time ago, I also worked for eBay and also working for Yahoo. Probably yeah. not on my LinkedIn, but this long time ago, uh, still like uh, you know, I'm very fortunate to work with all these like wonderful company in my career. Yeah, and all these digital natives, but you did say something that I think is important about how perhaps at one point in time, the way organizations view data was separate from the, let's say, application, the business application or operational application, whereas you have always seen it as being part of that. Did I understand that correctly? Yes, I always with some part of the different data journey. In one of the talk I give, I talk about six layer of like the paradigm I describe. It's all the way from how you collect data, you transform data, eventually derive machine learning model and build the insight. And in my career, I basically you know live in this paradigm. I work in almost every space.
this or the period, but I do some data cleaning, I write a machine learning model. I, I, I'm also like very familiar with SQL. Actually, I taught SQL language or data language at the UCLA uh, when I was uh, studying my PhD there. And, and, and of course, now I'm dealing with business decision, acquisition, but still we need to uh, make a lot of decision based on data. So I would say that the, uh, I think data is an ecosystem. It helped not just to generate the code, but also today it's part of decision-making for many business leaders. Yeah, so it's part of the business decision-making for leaders. And so now you as the new CDO, relatively new CDO at Etsy, what was it that attracted you to Etsy at this point in time? I'm the first CDO at Etsy. So before me, there no another CDO. And at the time when I have this opportunity, I ask myself the same framework whether I would be regret. Of course, I want to live in New York and you know enjoy the East Coast. <laughs> That's one thing that really attract me. And um, myself and my family and my friends, we all love Etsy. That's of course another reason that, that we, 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 I think Etsy is a place that I really want to work for them. And, but I think fundamentally is, when I joined Etsy, we are happen to be in a journey to move from a data center to the cloud. So we eventually pick Google as our partner, and that's how I also uh, work as a Google advisory board member in the Google that uh, helped them to set up a product strategy. But the um, but my full time job is at Etsy to 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 help them to make the most value out of the data they have. I think. Even I say this 20 years of journey, but the data become the new oil or like become something that people really, really feel the power of that is starts probably a few years ago. So I think, of course, the whole theory can last for many, many years. But I think starting probably uh, five years or seven years ago, you start to see this title like chief data officers in big companies. And even today, um, I think uh, there are still many companies that don't have such a role, but uh, I believe this will be the future that uh, more and more company will be finding the, uh, the, the reason that they should invest in, in having a data executive in their leadership team. Yeah, and it might be um, a matter of the size that Etsy has grown to, whereas let's say data would be a part-time role for somebody else. Maybe um, it's it's the rapid growth at Etsy as well. Yes, we uh, like Etsy has been growing uh, very rapidly uh, because we have new leadership team. Um, the Josh Silverman, our CEO, and Mike Fisher, our Mike Fisher, our CTO, we uh, kind of they joined the company about four or five years ago, and um, and and the Etsy happened to, of course, the during the, the this COVID, everyone stayed at home and e-commerce, like uh, people joke about three years in three months, right? So <laughs> the three year of digital transformation happened in three months. So things going very, very quickly in the last uh, few years. Yeah, I don't think it's a joke. I think it's a reality. I, I think it's um, something that in a way it's been a positive, it's been a forcing function for many organizations. So you mentioned migrating your data center to the Google Cloud, and I would presume Google BigQuery, is that right? Yes, Google BigQuery is one of the key product we are using. And also many other uh, like a product provided by Google. We're using uh, not just Google BigQuery, we're using basically all the Google technology, even the data pipeline, they have something called data flow. And, and also, of course, if you are doing machine learning, TensorFlow, which is very popular for doing machine learning and deep learning uh, like models, we also use all of these products. Yeah, so they're a really important partner to ThoughtSpot, but I want to make sure um, a couple things. Everyone is trying to accelerate. If, if they were not born in the cloud, they're trying to accelerate getting all their data into the cloud. As you went through that, um, are there any lessons learned or can we make it any easier or is it just it's hard? Uh, I would say, you know, it's non-negotiable today if you are not in the cloud. And here's the reason. Let me uh, just give an a, a, a example to help people to, or executive or manager to know why this is necessary. Think about like, like another company who also on the cloud. 
and they they find uh, like say a vulnerability or like a, a problem they need to fix. So anyone who find a problem they fix will naturally just solve everyone else, right? So when 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 I think it is not really efficient to run your own uh, in hardware infrastructures as a software company. So the investment is actually pretty high, and also. If this is not your competitive advantage, investing in those data infrastructure doesn't really pay off. And like a, a lot of e-commerce, um, you have holiday season, right? So imagine that the, your traffic will went to the roof during the Christmas, right? And then having cloud give you a lot of advantage because to some extent you can have elastic cloud, meaning that you can have on demand. You say, I need a, a 2X or 3X on my machine. And it's just a few button click away. Of course, you need to, if you really need to like a, add another 2000 server, you need to give Google a heads up. But generally speaking, you know, all this headache went away because all you need to do is just forecast the demand and then, you know, set up a planning and then click it and then problem solve. Yeah, so for sure that elasticity um, is critical, especially in retail or coming out of the busy holiday season. The other thing is the ability to run some of these experiments um, more rapidly. So tell us a little bit how you've brought that experimentation culture and process to Etsy. Yeah, Etsy always have an experiment the cultures, but I think it the, the fun fact is that uh, you can always find opportunity to improve your experiment. So there are actually uh, two things we um, spend a lot of time trying to, to improve since I joined Etsy. The first thing is, um, is you, how reliable you can trust the A-B test the result or experiment the results. So it's actually require a lot of statistical thinking because you know, human always made a mistake when they um, kind of uh, try to interpret the data based on instinct. And sometimes this is a mathematical problem. You just need to figure out how to do something in a statistical significant way so that you can trust the data. I think one thing, for example, we always joke about p-value. And p-value, like, a, you know, you can set p-value to 0 0.1, 0 0.05, but maybe very few exactly really know what's the difference between 0. 0 0.5 and 0 0.1, right? And then, and even the meaning of p-value, like people just know, oh, this is a value I can set. If I put it smaller, then I can get it more accurate. But uh, is that really true? Like, do you really know what the p-value it is? I think uh, there are a lot of these, um, I think as a data executive in the leadership team, I think one of the value having a, a data person sitting on the table is to help the executive team to understand the meaning of each this kind of setting and also understand like uh, how you interpret the results. And I think that's uh, kind of, to me, uh, the, the, the first is like a reliability or trustworthy of and how you interpret your data and set it, everything right. And the second thing is velocity. I think um, since I joined the company, uh, working with uh, my manager and also my peers, we are always trying to uh, like try more experiments and then learn from those experiments. I think one thing which is kind of, uh, I learned this surprising in my career is that the human instinct is often wrong. You thought that if I change this color from blue to red, the people will like that. That's your opinion. You are just one person. Even you have 20 years of experience in this field, you could be wrong. And I think I can show you tons of examples that the, the data will show you totally different than what you thought to be right is indeed not what your customer thought. And, and I think this kind of um, focusing on learning and using velocity as a way of measuring a learning speed is very critical because as a general trend in Silicon Valley, we want to fail fast. If we try something, we know it's not working, we want to try something different. I think this kind of incrementality introduces a lot of breakthrough. And as you can see that we keep introducing new feature, new style, and we, we rely on experience to tell us whether we are making a right decision or a wrong decision. So generally speaking, we don't uh, make a decision based on um, like, a, um, like our instinct or experience. We trust the experience results and use them to make the right decision. 
Yeah. So intuition or experience plus data, I think is the most powerful combination. But is there an example that you're allowed to publicly share where maybe the experiment didn't or your A-B testing did not really reveal the results you expected or that it was wrong, that it later proved to be wrong? Yeah, I, I think one thing, for example, is um, I will say this is actually uh, counterintuitive is we always know that if you can get a faster results to uh, like when people like uh, browse your website, if, the, if you can show the results faster, then you can get the, like uh, the people are more likely to use the website. I think intuition, this is kind of make perfect sense. But the, the question here is that the, does there really a difference between 10 milliseconds or 12 milliseconds or 15 milliseconds, right? So intuition will say that, the, come on, as a human, what's the difference between 10 milliseconds and 15 milliseconds? Probably we don't need to even care about this minor millisecond difference. But if you really try A-B test, you will find that, oh, no, totally different. If you can speed up even just one millisecond, there are significant improvement, like, um, like user engagement and, of course, the revenue and everything is right. So it's kind of one example that uh, um, people can think about. Like uh, even your intuition, think one millisecond doesn't matter. It's actually matter because sometimes this one millisecond, especially for people who are using their mobile device, the user experience can be totally different, especially when the network is spotty. So I think we don't know why this is really matter. What we know is that uh, when you say one millisecond doesn't matter, you could be wrong. Right, right. So you're really using data um, not just for the machine learning, but for the product design, the the shopping and website design, the mobile app design. Is that right? Yes, we we'll actually test this on not just UI design and also um, like uh, uh, the algorithms, like everything we can test. We always test before we uh, kind of formally launch that. So to some extent, uh, um, one can assume that uh, I mean not just Etsy. I think every modern website today. They basically test everything before they launch it. Well, you hope they do. <laughs> I think do. that I think that depends on which industry and how analytically savvy uh -huh. they, or how data savvy they really are. Or maybe disagree with me. I don't know. Yeah, I think if they have the uh, bandwidth or resource, of course, depending on the scale. If you are a star, only have ten people, like uh, you are still trying to find your market fit, then probably you don't have to do that. But the, uh, but uh, what you do is just doing a longer term of A-B test. You just launch something, wait for a few months and see how things goes. But still, you are test. It's just like uh, how rigorous you want to be. Yeah, yeah. And so the other part um, that I've heard you talk about before is the idea. So you you spoke about educating the leaders about data, but it's also about embedding machine learning experts inside every product team within Etsy. Can you elaborate a little bit more on that? You know, um, the, there are a few things that has been changing the last few years. Um, if 10 years ago, uh, machine learning, take machine learning class or AI class, it's very, probably 50 students will took this class when they are in computer science or, 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 or whatever uh, subject they, they, their major is. But today, almost every student, when they go to school, even they are not studying computer science, maybe they study management, they probably took an AI class or management class. Or you can go to Coursera, and there are tons of introduction to machine learning, introduction to AI. So. I would say one key difference, almost everyone in software in industry, especially the new grad, they were already exposed to machine learning and AI. So in the past, there is a concept like AI is a bunch of nerds or scientists sitting in a lab, and then you know they come with this fancy algorithm, and then eventually uh, they push this out, doing A-B tests, and then we implement that. This is like an old model. Probably 10 years ago, that's true. But this is not the case these days. We see so many people want to using data to improve their uh, software or product. And we also see almost everyone 
are starting getting educated on machine learning and AI. So instead of trying to create a special lab or a special uh, cohort of people trying to focus on the top notch, like a uh, you know, kind of prototype and production, right now we our general philosophy is that uh, we want to hire people with machine learning background or train people with machine learning background, and then we will have one or two, you know, senior very uh, like senior scientists which can join. Uh, the group to help to guide the, the direction, but the journey speaking is almost like a, it's a soon and to train and to educate everyone, even the manager to know the the data, like a, like how you make using data, make a decision, what is machine learning look like? I think it's a commodity today, in my opinion. And that's why we make this shift like, a, and that's the you will see in our uh, job post as well. Like almost everything is looking for machine learning engineer, data scientists. Yeah. That's why, yeah. Yeah, very tight labor market. Although you use the term nerd and AI nerd and a lot in the industry use data geek. And I feel like we need to start a mission to make it like data rock stars. This is a cool space, not a geeky or nerdy space. It's now um, data is part of everyone's job. So I, I don't see it geeky or nerdy at all. Yes. Same here. So I'm very fortunate that to see this trend comes to the real life. Just like statistic help us to make better decisions. So anyone need to know some statistic for the same reason. Yeah, for sure. Now you're um, so Shu Sheng, your six your six uh, levels in your pyramid. The top one that you had was insight, and I had to chuckle because then a little bit to the side you put end action. And one of the trends that I wrote about for 2022 that I think we've been waiting for in the industry, but has been hard to get to, is closing that loop between insight and action. What are your thoughts on this? Is now finally the time when this is possible or why is this still elusive? I would say that the People do action no matter you have insight or not, right? Like a, as a business, um, to some extent that you try new things. And when I say using insight to, to decide action, to some extent, uh, doesn't mean you are always right. You know, there's a book called Thinking in Bats, which is a highly recommend if you are a data leader because it's, you're a data person, so probability and bets make sense. And I think the core idea of the thinking bets is that uh, you don't have to be right all the time. But what you try to do is that you don't want to judge your, your success based on just outcome. You should judge your success based on the decision quality. And if you have a good insight, and, and, and even the outcome is better, I mean, this is life. Like, doesn't mean that you always be right. And if you want always to be right, there are very few things you can do. But the one thing you can do is that, uh, to invest in insight such that when you're making a decision, you know the, the reasons and insight behind the decision. And this gives you higher probability of making a right decision. So this concept of thinking in bets is what I kind of try to frame the, this pyramid is that uh, to use this kind of knowledge to help you to make a better quality decision. Yeah, I just had to quickly check it. Thinking in Bets by Annie Duke. I yes. did read this. She's the professional poker player, I think, right? Yes. So we invite she... her to give a talk at that see as well. So Oh, <laughs> interesting. Yeah, that very good. She she has a good segment on resulting that even if you made the decision and you didn't get the desired outcome, it doesn't necessarily mean that it was the wrong decision. It was just what information you had available to you at the time. Yes. There's a, a joke, which I don't want to know which company I saw this joke, is that uh, uh, you know, I want to see a bug report to say, hey, you know, there's a bug. I said, okay, there's a bug. And they say that when I do X, like I should see Y, but I see Z. And you know that in machine learning, anything is probability. So not every email you say is a spam mail, it's really a spam mail. So there's always a bug. So there's never, you, even you can reach 99.9%, .9%, you can still see a bug. But uh, you can fix that bug because if you fix that bug, it's something we call overfitting is that uh, you, you solve everything in the past, but for the future, the model doesn't work the way you hope them to operate. 
I think this kind of new thinking in the, in the field is 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 uh, something which I I think is very critical for all the leader in the field, especially if they are you know a lot of leader here uh, come from software background. So I think this kind of data thinking and and, and probably probabilistic thinking and the, the insight or the decision outcome is not necessary to be uh, related to the quality of the decision. I think all these interesting uh, kind of uh, insight are, are something that I always tell people to 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 be open about it. Yeah, so now I have to wonder, um, because you do have a heavy math background, but you also have a philosophy background. So does this come into play as you're applying the math or the data insight to a particular problem? Yeah, I I think I won't call myself a philosophy background because every every doctor, they get a PhD degree. That's the the close I can get to the philosophy. But what I I believe is that... uh, uh, the, there are many traps people can can run into. Uh, for example, like, I think one of the karma trap I saw is a lot of people were assuming correlation is causality. I will give an example. Like, uh, oftentimes, when we see a data, we see X and Y. And let's say if X is number of advertisements you put online, and Y is your revenue, and you see a positive correlation, you see, oh, if I increase my advertisement, I see better revenue. And many leaders were in their head, I mean, it's a human, so you're why in a way that uh, my instinct told me that I should invest my advertisement, I will get a better revenue. And, but he said, if you if replace X with like say, if you say X is ice cream sales on a beach, and then Y is like say, how many shock attacked on the beach? And you, all, you will also see a positive correlation but doesn't mean that the sale more ice cream will means the more shock, like to attack human being. It's just because it's summer. So everyone go to the beach and they buy more ice cream. So for the second example, people can easily know why this is ridiculous. But for the first example, when you only see the ads and then the, the, the revenue, sometimes people's mind will just naturally draw this kind of conclusion, like X will kind of introduce the 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 why and this kind of cause that is totally make no sense statistically speaking so i think this kind of training as uh how you see correlation how you see causality and there are a lot of pitfalls that the people can 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 run into i gave a talk recently uh at our ethics conference i think the slides can be found on my linkedin so uh, feel free to check that. I, I talk a lot of bios, like a survival bios, and talk about this kind of co- correlation and talk about the, the, the sampling bios. There are a lot of things that, you know, if you don't pay attention, you'll easily just make mistake on those bios and then make a wrong decision. Yeah, for sure. That correlation does not mean causality. And I have to wonder if that's part of the overall need for greater data fluency or data literacy for people yeah. to understand that. Um, You mentioned sampling bias, and I know one of your foundational segments in your pillars is really about the quality of the data. I also find it really interesting that Andrew Eng recently came out with a challenge that he feels that the machine learning community has not paid enough attention to the basis of data. So do you agree with that? Um, Were they not recognizing what bias data is and gaps in the data? Or what do you think? I I believe that uh, our academic society encourage people to research on algorithms and not encourage people to um, kind of invest in data quality. Oh, and, interesting. And, and, yeah, so this maybe doesn't mean frame in such a way. Usually, if you hope for A and you, but you, you incentive for B, this never work, right? So if you think about how you get your paper, get accepted. Usually, whether a reviewer, which I also serve in many conference committees, so we review papers. We, we pay attention more on your algorithm, and your contribution. Like uh, we want you to pick the same data. So the data should be the same, right? So it's apple to apple comparison. And so we always say this paper make a breakthrough because they come with better algorithm. But you are very rare see that the, I using the same algorithm by using better data. And that's why this paper get a select. And I think that's probably what he refers to is that the academic actually 
it's 10 years, I mean, just roughly just put a number there, it's like ahead of industrial application because they try something very cutting edge. And, but the, the, the way uh, we incentivize the research is to focus on algorithm improvement and not trying to make the data cleaner or, or with a better resolved data. And naturally, this lead to the, 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 the low hanging fruit is that if you can improve your data quality in practice, often you can easily get a huge win. And, and, and most of the time, we don't, uh, as an industry, uh, you know, you hire people from school and they, they were trained academic. And so these files is actually in their brain, they come to the work and they majorly pay attention on algorithm, not on data. So this is what I believe he refers to is that uh, they are way under invest in making the data quality better. Yeah, so Xu Sheng, you just gave me an aha moment and an unfortunate aha moment because you're saying that it goes back to what's rewarded in academia. And so there is um, an emphasis on optimizing the model. And yet, to me, having grown up through the data, more the data and analytics profession, it's obvious to me the model is only as good as the data you feed it. And isn't this why, of course, we have biased AI? The um, people building it, if they don't understand that foundational impact, it exacerbates biased AI. Yes. And then I can give a one example, which is not a surprise, is if, you, if I always say that when you build the AI model, you think about it's a, it's a kid trying to learn from data. So you tell you, here's the input, here's the data, here's the output, is a good behavior. You somehow create a reward and penalty so that this machine pick up the behavior through data. And eventually you send this machine outside as a module to operate. And if you, let's say if you are a website like Etsy, um, we have much more female shopper than male shoppers. So naturally what the machine will pick up is a pattern that optimizes for female shopper if you don't pay attention to, to, to clean up your data. So imagine that there's a, there's a male shopper come to the site, but the machine learning was, it was trained based on the majority of the data which is come from the female shoppers. Of course they are biased because this is how machine learning work is to derive pattern from the data. And, and, and that's why, I believe there are uh, one of the opportunity um, in the coming years is definitely trying to figure out a way to, to either personalize the results or figure out a way to build a model that is more generalizable and can apply to a different scenario. So to some extent, reach will get a richer in data as well. It's like a, if all your data is, is, is kind of in, just collect from one uh, kind of specialized like a group of people, then of course these things are not generalizable and, and this is definitely an opportunity to fix in the future. For sure, yeah, so it's um, interesting. Tell me a little bit about why you're so excited about this emerging field of data observability. I, I, I think that a, it is very important, like a, when you create a machine learning model, you will be able to interpret the, the behavior. So here's what I, 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 like my instinct told me, right? So um, the, the, the current development of machine learning, a lot of the technology is based on deep learning, which is a newer network solutions. And, and this kind of new solution, unlike the traditional statistical based solution or tree based solution, the, the, the classical solution, you know something work, but you don't know why the work. And sometimes you, if when things are not working the way you want, you don't even know like what's going on. So um, to me, it's more about, I know I can always win this game, but I don't really know the rules. And I think it's very dangerous. And I think somehow, um, I think machine learning is not to replace human, but to help us to, to solve the problem in a better way. And I think no matter you want to avoid bias, or you want to um, kind of uh, find the next breakthrough. I think it is very, very important for human to be able to, to be able to work with the data. And, and when I say work with data, the number one step is that you first you need to definitely know how to observe your model, observe your data, and also 
from there, you need to figure out a way to interpret the data. So there are a lot of research these days, for example, uh, they will tell you, like as a human, the intuition, why machine uh, makes such a decision, like say computer vision, right? So when I look at this, when I look at you, I, I pay attention to your face and I'm not paying attention to your background. So is your machine learning really pay attention to the subject or they pay attention to the background? I think if you will be able to tell that, then it will kind of help you understand why the outcome doesn't look like what you, you hope. I think this kind of interpretability will be very important, especially when we apply machine learning technology on computer vision, image processing, video understanding. I think it's actually tell like the attention of the machine that is will be very important for the future applications. Yeah, I think we're just getting started there. Um, Xu Sheng, you already mentioned one book that you like, Thinking in Bets. In this fast-paced world, how do you keep up with all these innovations and trends? Is it reading? Is it conferences, podcasts? And if so, what would you recommend to our listeners? Oh, you're asking my secret. <laughs> <laughs> yes, of course. That's what this podcast is all about. <sighs> oh, okay. So... There are, there are a few things I do. The first thing is that uh, I, I, I try to kill two birds with one stone. So I give back to the community by serving a lot of academic conference, also their senior program community. I, and in my career, I also some serve as a chair in a workshop, for example. And the, the, this forced me to actually you know, read a lot of paper. Of course, like uh, it's, it's, it's hard work, it's not never easy. But the, on one hand, I give back to the community, stay close with the cutting edge like a technology, knowing what's coming next. On the other hand, that I kind of force myself to read a lot of paper because I have to, I just need to, this is part of the, the process of the work. I always believe that uh, the best way is to somehow create a work that uh, force you to, to learn. Like for example, for the, the, the podcast today, when we talk to each other, I will force myself like say, okay, people probably will ask me which book I read. So I probably should read more books, right? So I think that's, uh, <laughs> that's what I, I, I always tell myself is that you need to incentive yourself to do the to, to, to do the things that you hope you do, right? So I, I kind of when I, when I, whenever I'm counting priorities, other than the regret minimization framework, another thing I will ask myself, is that possible something I hope to achieve? And, and if I do this job, then I can also achieve the, the long-term growth for my own career. And that's how I kind of reading papers, reading books, is to make sure that I have incentive myself to do such an activity. Yeah, or people, you don't have to read books, although I am an avid reader. Um, some people, it's more podcasts or articles yeah. or going to meetups, going to um, whether it's virtual or hopefully we'll get back to more in person soon. Um, well, Chen Chang, it's, uh, Chu Chang, it's been a great, gosh, I really muddled that, sorry. <laughs> Xu Shen, it's been great having you on the Data Chief. I always like to end with one question, and I'm going to let you choose depending on the mood you're in. Um, what are you most grateful for? Or if you think about something that's totally made you laugh out loud in the last year, what would that be? I think I'm most grateful is like a Honestly, is to to like I think this paradigm shift like uh, I think we we'll talk about data right like uh, there are a lot of investment in a company and to enable remote work, which also means that uh, data privacy, data protection is super super important. And in the past, uh, you know, you can easily protect them by saying that you can only come to the office, sitting in this building. That's how you keep your this kind of PII or personal identifiable data, like a secure, but now you can because everyone work remotely using VPN, new logging, invest in security, privacy, encryptions. And I think this investment is, is something that I'm really grateful for is that uh, today we are very fortunate as a data expert that, that, that we can actually work from anywhere. I think at the we are very remote friendly. So uh, our, the people they can work from anywhere in the United States, they actually move around and, and, and no matter where they go, we, we create an infrastructure for them to, to be able to uh, actually access to the network. And I, I think for myself, it's, it's, 
you know, as an executive, I usually travel a lot and I, I, I spend a lot of the work. And, but this year, I, I really, I really feel great, like appreciate that, that I have more time with my, my son. He's 10 years old and, and I'm trying to teach him Python. And that's oh, actually wow. you know, this you is, you know, a lovely <laughs> moment that, that uh, he never listened to me. And then he always invented his own syntax. That is really, really cool. I'm going to have to connect you to some others who have been teaching their kids Python and SQL in the last year in this pandemic. So that's a super cool one. It is. Shushan, thanks so much for being on The Data Chief. Thank you for having me here. Nice to talk to you.